political fight against inflation is heating up in one corner of the ring. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and in the other, new Tory leader Pierre Polyev. Take a listen. We are retaining fiscal firepower and, at the same time, ensuring that those who need support don't get left behind. Conservatives are putting him on notice that we will oppose any attempts by his government to raise taxes on working people or seniors in this country. So the battle lines are drawn. Whose approach will Canadians support? And what does it tell us more broadly about the new political landscape? Let's bring in David Hurley, a former advisor to Prime Minister Paul Martin, host of the Hurley Burley podcast. He's with us tonight from Toronto. And here with me in studio in Ottawa, Rubicon Strategy CEO and former advisor to Prime Minister Stephen Harper, Corey Tonight. Hello, both of you. Good to have you back with us. Uh, David, I'll start with you. I actually want to start, before we get into this sort of uh, the dynamics of the fight that or the political battle lines that are drawn up, just if you were to grade the first few days of the newly minted Tory leader, Pierre Polyev's time as leader, what would you tell our audience tonight? Uh, some things that I think are going well, some things I think are going less well. I don't know, maybe a B minus. Um, I think that, uh, I, I think that the, um, the chippiness in the news conference yesterday uh, is something that while it may be play well to certain people is probably not going to stand him in good stead. And I understand there's both sides to that story, but, you know, just I don't think people are going to like, if it portends a lot of conflict and constant anger, I don't think people are going to like that about politics uh, very much. And and that kind of might be said about the situation with the, with the Quebec MP as well. On the other hand, I really thought his um, leadership team was very clever. Um, a, I saw lots of people in there that are talented, but I also think that in terms of he has thought through the kind of attacks that the liberals normally launch against conservative leaders, and he seems in many respects to be actively positioning himself against it in a much cleverer way than previous people have done. Uh, let's pick up on that, uh, Corey, and, and just I guess if if the conservatives and if Pierre Polyev more specifically wanted to frame the political kind of back and forth right now. How would they frame it, and how do you think the Liberals would prefer to frame it? Well, I think the frame for the Conservatives is pretty pretty straightforward. To to have a uh, a kind of a dual focus: one on uh, the issues that are the most important to Canadians, namely the economy and dealing with inflation and interest rates, and then second on the competency of the Liberal government to not only deal with that, but things in general. So whether it's you know something as simple as a passport uh, 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 mess, uh, trying to get a, something simple done from government and failing at that, but then also bridging to uh, the larger issues that are important. And the message being that these guys aren't competent and they're not focused on the, on the issues that are important to you. I, I think that's really the, the narrative. And to try to not let other things get in the way or distract from that, to just maintain that laser-like focus on, on those key issues that are, are, are really you know, big dr vote drivers. So then the Liberals come to you and say, well, how do we counter that? What's our, what's our framing to counter that? What do you tell them? Well, I think they have a more, uh, like a bigger challenge because uh, they have to do a number of things and some of them are in, in uh, opposition to, to the others. So, you know, I think they are smart people too and know that they have to uh, actually successfully focus on those key economic issues and have an answer and they're kind of trying to do that too but they're also trying to keep the government afloat which means they have to talk about these sort of small ball side issues that that the NDP uh, are demanding of them if they want to uh, continue them to continue to hold the government up so uh, I don't think anyone's going to be looking and saying uh, uh, my grocery bill's going through the roof, my gas bill's through the roof, I'm dealing with uh, all these inflation issues, I'm worrying about paying my mortgage when it comes due because interest rates are way up, and you're saying, what, uh, some sort of dental plan that's going to be means tested and I'm not going to qualify for? Like it, so there's a big disconnect, I, I think, that's inherent in, in those two things, but obviously they need, need to deal with uh, keeping their commitments to the NDP if they want to still have the government afloat, so that's a must-do. But it's in contradiction with the other must-do, which is uh, is to focus on on the main economic issues. Is it though, David, from your perspective, in contradiction? Because I think the Liberals and the NDP at this point would say those things that they announced yesterday are actually targeted at helping people who are feeling the worst effects of rising cost of living. I, um, I guess my question is kind of twofold: A, uh, do you think that's what they'd say? And B, do you think that that accomplishes what they would hope it would politically? 
It's a very limited package. I mean, in fairness to the government, they're obviously trying to be somewhat fiscally responsible about this matter because it's it's a much less inclusive relief package than, say, Ontario did before the campaign period or Saskatchewan has just announced in terms of broad-based relief to the entire population. This is very targeted. That means it's going to be less politically potent as well uh, because a lot of the inflationary pressure and anxiety is felt by middle-class people uh, who, who might not qualify for this relief or to the same amount. So I don't know that this is the silver bullet. I certainly would agree, I think, with the core of Corey's analysis because the the default positionings in the public mind for the parties are that the Conservatives care about money and the Liberals care about people more. And so that means that people always assume that the Liberals are going to be better at social programs than the Conservatives, unless there's some reason to think differently. And people always believe that Conservatives are going to be better at the economy than Liberals, unless there's some reason to think differently. And I would argue that there's a very strong imperative for the Liberals to give people some reason to think differently. And that means uh, tightening up their game on the economy, both in terms of the content of what they're doing um, and and in terms of the messaging around it, um, and uh, you know, you they they cannot go, afford to go into the next election being seen as second best to deal with the core economic issues facing the country, or they'll likely lose. Uh, let me ask a follow up to you on that. Do you think they have the runway left to be able to uh, pivot to that position? It, it, that would depend on how long the arrangement lasts. 2025 is certainly long enough to do that, but they may need to do it sooner to keep that coalition alive because the NDP are going to be very acute to what's happening um, uh, around them. And if the government is in trouble, they, especially on pocketbook issues, they may not want to be tethered to it for three years. So, yeah, I think they've got the runway uh, to do it, and I think they've got the uh, I think they've got the issue set to do it. Um, they just have to really focus on economics and understand that that's the task right now. Uh, both you and David uh, Corey have uh, very uh, adequately established what the vulnerability for the Liberals is. What what in your view is the vulnerability for the Conservatives based on what you've witnessed over the last four days from the, the new leader? Well, I'd say there are two things. One uh, one that's just generally out there for for uh, I think any conservative leader, and we've seen this happen before, and that's to run a really tight ship with your caucus, and then when you get to an election campaign, your candidates. The candidates are much easier than the caucus in the sense that uh, the new leader can have a, a huge influence on who those people are going to be and can vet them by, what, what, by whatever means you know uh, he feels is appropriate. Uh, the existing caucus... Uh, this is a caucus that is not used to having a lot of discipline. They're, they've gone through multiple leaders. Uh, there are a lot of challenges there. Uh, there are some people who are, uh, you know, came in uh, more as uh, single issue folks as opposed to uh, a part of a broader team. And, and those folks are always the biggest challenge to deal with. Uh, and we've seen previous leaders having trouble controlling that stuff. So to, to maintain that message discipline and that focus on the economy, it's not just talking about that. It's about not talking about other things. It's about not riding your little hobby horse around Parliament Hill, uh, you know, whatever it is. Uh, so, you know, he has that challenge uh, because the Liberals are going to be there to pounce on on any statement that's outside of, of that message or could be problematic with other core you know, swing voters. And they're going to do that. I think the one for the leader personally, and we saw a little bit of it with a, that um, uh, heckling incident with, uh, uh, with a reporter before his uh, statement, it's to never let them see a sweat. You know, it's, Were you uh, surprised that he was thrown off yesterday? Uh, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, but it's understandable. Like, it's not something that, you know, uh, look, I've, I've, I've done communications jobs here on the Hill for a long time. I've never really seen that. It's, it's sort of uh, outside the norms of, uh, of uh, those interactions. What's normal is uh, reporters complaining about not getting enough questions, <laughs> all that. That's every day in, in Ottawa. Uh, but to, to you know, actively be heckled by, uh, by a reporter, and, and, and it's surprising because I know that reporter, and he's, you know, it's, I think that's he's not... he's worked for you. Yeah, yeah she's worked for me in the <laughs> and past. He, and he and, apologized, and, I should say. Yeah. yeah, he's apologized, and it's out of character. Everybody has a bad day, and, you know, everybody will just move on because that's what happens in these situations. But uh, it's to... Uh, uh, it's not just be thrown off. It's to... to uh, not uh, not come back with the, the question period retort. You know, it's to to maintain the tone and uh, the calm. 
is when you get into a, a you know a televised leader leader debate or some of these other forums, you know you you really have to maintain your composure, especially when you know the other guys want to paint you as. Uh, like, a, a, you know, somebody who's more angry or uh, intemperate, uh, you know, they're going to be trying to put uh, uh, Polyev in that box. And so you've got to really be actively resisting uh, the temptation to, uh, uh, to, to have the clever retort. David, I'll ask you the same. I just have a few seconds left with the same question about uh, what you would identify as the, the greatest vulnerability for them after you just identified what the vulnerability is for the Liberals. I just quickly point out for our viewers a little update. You had mentioned Alain Reyes, the Quebec MP who uh, quit caucus yesterday. Uh, today he's saying that his supporters are getting text messages saying that, that, that uh, and we've got an example of it there in French, saying that he should be uh, booted as an MP. Uh, the the Polyev uh, OLO, I should call it, or the, the op op Office of the opposition is saying this isn't us, but he's saying that it is just a little bit of an update for our viewers. So uh, uh, certainly an issue over the last 24 hours for, for the new leader. What would you identify more largely as a as, as their vulnerability going forward? Well, I think I think there's two. First of all, I think that normally uh, somebody who wins the leadership in the fashion that Mr. Polyev did would have received an enormous surge in the polls and would have a tremendous personal popularity right now. And his party would have very high popularity right now, maybe ephemeral after leaderships. But that's traditionally happened. It did not happen for him. And so there's something about his campaign that excited 400,000 people tremendously. But other Canadians, not so much. And I think they need to figure that out. And I think it does have a lot to do with tone. And the second thing I think is if the Liberals do a good job of exposing his economic agenda, it really is a point of view that is shared by a minority of Canadians. Okay. Well, I'll, I, I would ask you to expand, but I'm already way over time. So I'll leave it. <laughs> oh, sorry, David. It's a little bit more conservative. It's a little bit more small government. It's a little bit more focused on tax cuts and deregulation than is normally the center of Canadian politics. Okay. Well, well, we shall see. Thank you very much, David. Thanks, Corey. David Hurley and Corey tonight. <laughs> Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.